Well, good morning and uh, good to see you this day as we gather together to uh, do a little study on Philippians 2, verses 12 to 30. Uh, Pastor Greg, as uh, many of you know already, but uh, again, good to see you this day. Haha, -ha. even though actually I'm the one being seen. I know, corny jokes to start off the day. All right, so here we go. We're going to start off with a word of prayer, and then we're going to get into the good stuff here. And uh, did a little visual representation this time, so we'll talk about that as we go through this. But uh, let's begin with a word of prayer. Father God in heaven, we thank you for all that you have done and all that you're going to do. We ask and pray that you continue to bless our time today as we study, as we hear your word, as we read it, as we uh, meditate upon it. And uh, Father, as it encourages our lives uh, to follow after you. So continue today, especially as we talk about being a light in this world, uh, Lord, and what that actually means, um, again, as we share your good news. So we love you, we thank you, and we ask for your blessing this day. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so uh, here we go. So today, uh, as we get into our section of scripture, um, just to let you know, it's been an interesting week this week uh, with the big storms that we've had here in Schaumburg, Illinois. Uh, the rain came and it came and it came and uh, we had a little flooding in our basement, but everybody's okay. Everything is all right. We have uh, got the fans running. We've pulled up the carpet to be able to try to salvage that what we can. Uh, but it is amazing uh, to see what uh, just a little bit of rain can do in just, oh, I don't know, a few, few hours. And um, in fact, some of those rains were coming down so fast. But uh, just to let you know, we're all good. Thanks for praying. Thanks for all those who offered help as well. But uh, yeah, just wanted to update you with that. So with that being said, let's get into the word today. If you have your Bibles, which I hope that you do, um, Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 to 30. That's what we're going to go over today. And as you notice on there, or at least in a lot of the Bibles, it has lights uh, in the world, and that's the title of this section. And uh, we're going to get into some very, really kind of uh, heavy doctrine kind of stuff already right off the bat, but it's it's really easy to explain once that you go through it. So, without any further ado, uh, Philippians chapter 2, starting at verse 12. Now, I did put the uh, scriptures up on the screen in case you don't have your Bible, um, or if you want to look at it quickly, but I do encourage you uh, to highlight or underline uh, I've got mine underlined here in the Bible and my notes on the side here too. Um, but let's get into it right here, verses 12 and 13. Paul is writing again in prison to uh, the people of Philippi. And it says, uh, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, both to will and and to work for his good pleasure. All right, so we're going to stop right there already. Um, just to let you know, it almost sounds like, too, that uh, normally, you, well, maybe you might not say this to one another, but uh, my beloved, um, that is really actually the plural here. And uh, Paul is writing to the congregation, and he's, he's treating them as something special, as someone close to him. And he's saying, all right, guys, this is the way it is. You're supposed to, uh, again, obey, and not, not only my presence, but much more my absence. And then we get to the big one. Are you ready? Here's the question for you today. What does it mean when Paul is writing out the idea that he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling? I want you to go ahead and pause this right now and, and think about it for a minute. And then when you're ready, come back on. So we're going to pause right now. And then I'll be waiting. And welcome back. Uh, if not, it's kind of funny always, but that's the way we have to do things now. Um, so, so the reality is that um, the, the thought right away might be that we're supposed to work out our salvation because obviously that's what it says in the English. But the meaning behind it is a very important doctrinal issue. And it is talking about how we are to be about in the plan of, of salvation. Now, the first automatic thing that we have to understand is that God has done the entire work through his son, Jesus Christ. We cannot in no way, shape, or form earn or, or be able to do something in our lives to be able to 
actually have our own salvation. It, it does not work that way. What ends up happening is, is that Jesus Christ has done the work once and for all. When he died on the cross and rose again from the dead, it's finished. It's completely done. Okay? So that's why when you might hear other religions say that, oh, you have to behave a certain way, or you have to make these pilgrimages, or you have to, you know, do so many prayers or so many hoops to jump through. Um, no. And see, this is what makes Christianity, in other words, the true faith, something different. Um, the reality is that um, it's been done for us. And it's all by God's grace. It's his mercy that has done it. So that's very important to understand that. So when Paul writes this, he's writing to me, he says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And if we don't just stop right at that little location, we keep going, right? For it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. So there's the reasoning why. It's for, really, his good pleasure. That all the work that's been going on, he's already done it in you. And now you're going to continue to work it out. Well, to work that out means responding in faith, being able to do the things that God's calling you to do so that people might actually come to faith and, and know what's going on. If you'll take a, a look at the picture there, you've got the hands. And um, no, they're not my hands. Uh, it's a photo Photoshop, but here's the deal. Um, it's a reminder of me that we're supposed to be about the Father's business. And it's not always easy. Uh, it's going to get messy. It, it is something where this visual here is a reminder that as we go out, um, being a light in the world means that it's going to be actually dirty work. It's going to be uh, hard work. It, it's going to be the fact that we're having to live lives that, is, that, are, that is or are different uh, in the world. Lives that are different from the regular population. Uh, we will look different, um, and it's not that easy. So um, I know that sounds tough, it sounds rough, but the reward is so much better as we continue to strive in our faith to uh, do our Father's will, okay? So let's keep on rolling here. The next uh, two verses that we're gonna look at, Philippians 2, 14 to 16. So it says, do all things without grumbling or questioning that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the world of life, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. So again, we're looking at some things here, and, and we'll get to the visuals in just a minute, but um, I don't know about you, but 14, <laughs> 14 already starts to convict me. Uh, do all things without grumbling or disputing. Oh, come on. Really? Come on. <laughs> I'm, I'm complaining already, right? Wrong. Um, the idea here, again, that, that Paul is saying, hey, live the life of joy. Live the life as one who's been redeemed by Christ Jesus. And it says, do all things without grumbling or disputing, that you may be blameless and innocent, children of God, now, I don't know about you, but personally, my children do a lot of grumbling. They get a lot of arguing and disputing. Um, <laughs> the reality is, though, it's looking at that good side of the children where they're just walking in faith and they're listening to what is being said and told and all that kind of stuff. But here we are again, back to what um, Paul is writing. You know, we're in the midst of a, a crooked and twisted generation. Um, we do things different, hopefully than what others are doing around us. And what does that look like? Well, it looks like lights shining in the world. So let's stop right there at the end of 15 and, and take a look at our visuals over there. So you've got a candle and you've got the star there. Uh, that's the next one down. And then finally, uh, I don't know if you caught that one or not, but that one's the city on the hill. That's right. Um, you know, Jesus has asked us to let our lights shine before men. And then what do we do? We show our good works. In other words, it is the response, again, that has been um, allowed for us to serve in the kingdom. It's all done by the power of the Holy Spirit. We can't do anything on our own, but what we end up doing is, is serving. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, God has already set those works out ahead of time for us. 
And so what we are to do is be the light. So real quickly, if you want to uh, answer this question here, and uh, you're going to have to pause, obviously, in here in just a second. But the question really is, is how do you think that you can let your light shine in this world that we live in by just simply doing these things, by not grumbling or disputing, in other words, arguing? Um, how is it that you can be different in this world? Go ahead and pause right now and think about that and uh, give me an answer. All right, welcome back. Uh, so yeah, thinking about that, maybe you have thought that um, you know by those actions, you don't have to argue with family members. Maybe you don't have to argue with your neighbor. Maybe you don't have to argue with your political opponent. And I know that's hard to do, especially when you, me, everybody has different opinions. But the reality is, is that God has called us to be light in a darkened world. And where our light shines, it does make a difference. Just as you see in the candle, that light there, you can see it already start to glow where the candle is and the light around it. Even though it's in a darkened place, that light is so bright, your eyes focus right on that light. <coughs> Excuse me. And then also the star. Even though there are other stars out there, your eyes are drawn to that light. There's something different about that one. Even as you see all the different little speckles, the little dots, all those different things, your eye is drawn to the light. There's something different about how you and me, how we are to live. And finally then, that city on the hill. Um, yeah, you see the other buildings, you see other things that are around, it's just like the, every other part of the world, right? But when that city is placed on the hill, if you'll notice when you're looking at that picture, your eyes are automatically drawn up the hill and you're like wondering, well, what is that? Wow, is that a castle? Is that a, you know, big palace? Is it, a, what kind of institution? What kind of place? What kind of thing is that? Who lives there? And if we're called to be these things, these, you know, lights in the world, um, making sure that it gives light, that it brings hope, that it brings um, those things that God is calling us to do. Um, 16 then fig finishes out then, holding fast to the word of life, so that in the day of Christ, I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. In other words, Paul is saying, do the very things that I'm calling you to do. See, during his time, he did have teachers. He did have false people, and, and we're going to hear that a little bit later in the study here. but they're they're doing things that are not correct they're jealous that, that paul is telling them to do and behave like christ would uh, in fact if you saw uh, the bible study from last week with pastor jerry he talked about christ's humility those were those whole verses from 1 through 11 that christ's humility is there and, and we should follow and and be like him so uh taking time to think about those things very very important okay all right, let's go on to the next one. Philippians 2, 17 and 18. Paul writes, Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Now, again, using some history from the cultural reference, knowing what Paul was talking about, um, it was customary for the priest to be able to pour out drink offerings, and it could be either wine or it could be oil. And the picture that I showed on the left over there, um, that, that oil that is poured out, that is drawn or given um, as that sacrifice, uh, he's likening to something that the people would have known at that time. The idea that, again, as he says, to be poured out as a drink offering, upon the sacrificial offering of your faith. He's encouraging them to be different. He's encouraging them to uh, respond differently. And again, as this drink offering goes forth, um, you know, Paul is again rejoicing because of what's taking place. He knows that it will make the difference in the lives of other people. So 
again, looking at those verses, he'll be excited. He's rejoicing and glad that this is taking place. If you're following and obeying what God has commanded, uh, really to love him and to love one another. Serving in humility, serving other people, going and sharing the love of Jesus as um, he's asking people to do. Not only will it do well for him, but it makes him happy, uh, especially as they've learned, they've studied, and they're going through it. All right, our next one. Lots of imagery here. Uh, Philippians 2, 19 to 24, longer section, but um, we'll, uh, we'll get to this also. Paul writes, I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, so that I may, too, be cheered by news of you. For I have no one like him who will be genuinely concerned for your welfare. For they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know Timothy's proven worth, how as a son and as a father he has served with me in the gospel. I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. Now, um, going back to the first part here, um, he's hoping in the Lord Jesus, right? Great opportunity to uh, witness um, somebody to, to follow after example. Who do you put your hope in? Of course, it's the Lord Jesus. But even as you go about your daily business, as you know, Scripture even writes, um, as long as the Lord allows it, we will come and see you. We will come and do this. We will, you know, whatever. Um, usually it's, it's about um, actually traveling to the next place, if it's the Lord's will. And we do put our hope in Jesus that this is one of those things where he allows um, this to take place because he wants to send Timothy. Young Timothy learning to be that pastor he's studying he's learning from paul and if you caught it right here um he says so that i too may be cheered by news of you for i have no one like him what is it like for him who will be generally concerned for your well welfare now the next question here's where the question comes in Verse 21, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Tell me something. Here's the question. You might have to pause on this one. Uh, who is the they in verse 21? Go ahead and pause. That's right. Welcome back. If, um, if you understand then verse 21, for they all seek their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. Paul had been writing earlier that there were those that were mocking him. There were other people who were trying to share the news, but they were mocking him for what they were doing and, and telling. They were really kind of false teachers. The idea that um, those would not, those that weren't bringing the full truth of what God had said. And so Timothy, we find that he has a certain attitude about him. And if you look over at the picture, um, my guess is that this actually illustration um, is one of Jesus washing the disciples' feet. But it also fits in this that we're to do the same. We're supposed to follow after Jesus in humility and serve one another. So um, as Paul is writing this, as he's talking about it, he says, for they, those false ones, they're seeking their own interests. They're talking about how look at me, look how well I do, Who, who's more important actually? It, at this time, it's that preacher instead of Jesus Christ. And I wonder if that happens today. Hmm. Oh yeah, you, you probably have a few examples, don't you? You probably know of some really what we'd call false prophets or false teachers, false pastors who are more concerned about themselves versus what the good news is. And that good news is Jesus Christ the one who came to save, to really die for us, to, to give his life. That's who we uplift. That's who, at least I try in my words and in my teachings to be able to share, that's what we're doing. This is what this is all about. It's all about Jesus. So Paul continues to write in verse 22, but you know Timothy's proven worth. How as a son with a father, he has served with me in the gospel. Take a look at the visual down there. Now, 
I, after looking at a bunch of different pictures, um, I chose this one because this one really, really speaks to me. Um, I think it's really cool. Um, not only do you have that father kind of figure taking the son by the hand, but they're kind of walking and uh, I don't know, you see some different clouds, maybe some trees and uh, maybe it looks like even some pyramids, uh, kind of like a, I don't know, ancient times, right? Um, but they're walking on a track and that track is something that is a good reminder for all of us. Um, you've got the father leading the son down the right path. In other words, this is the track you're supposed to stay on. This is the very thing that you're supposed to do. And just like fathers to sons, mothers to daughters, um, parents to children, uh, and teachers to their students, they're imparting that knowledge to be able to share the knowledge that they have. In other words, to say, hey, this is what you need to know that will help you in life. This is what you need to know that if you stay on this path, it'll take you to that destination. And of course, in the picture, there's the light at the end of the tunnel, right? Or Well, no tunnel, but still, there's the light at the end. And I just, I can't think of a better picture here as the relationship of what Timothy and Paul have, that the worth is there. Timothy's been listening. He's been absorbing the knowledge. He's been uh, taking it on, and, and you see what's taking place. Um, he's leading him down the path, and there's the great picture of the father-son um, motif, I guess, if you will, the, that idea that this is what's taking place. And he says, I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. Now, reminder of where verse 23 and 24, Paul is sitting in, that's right, prison. We believe he's sitting in prison. He's writing to them, being able to share that, again, the hope of what's going to take place, that hopefully it is going to change. Maybe his circumstances will. He says, I hope, therefore, to send him just as soon as I see how it will go with me. And I trust in the Lord that shortly I myself will come also. So again, reminder for today, where do you put your trust? Whom do you put your trust in? The Lord. See, again, this is so encouraging as Paul is writing to the Philippians. It, it really works for us too. That no matter your circumstances, put your hope and trust in the Lord. Well, again, we've got that, we've got that question for us right now, right? So what's happening around us? The quarantine. We've got things going on. This is what we want to do, okay? All right. This next one is a famous uh, picture. And um, this is one where uh, many of you have seen this before, but let's read what it says in uh, Philippians 25 to 28. I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger, and minister to my need, for he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, and that I may be less anxious. This picture automatically speaks to the words that are on your screen there. Um, you know, here is the picture of Jesus, and he's holding up the person. Can you see what is in his hands? That's right, it's the mallet, and it's the nail. And the reality is that Jesus is holding to us, or holding on to us, us sinners even though we're the ones who have placed the nails in his hands and his feet. If you remember, Jesus had no sin, but Jesus was sent by the Father to save us. And we, because of our sin, needed saving. Obviously, the picture then shows, it represents that we're the ones who has placed those nails in Jesus' hands and feet. In other words, we're the reason Jesus came, because God loved us so much that he wanted to come and rescue us, even though or the cause. And so here, the worker, the fellow worker here, brother and fellow worker, fellow soldier, he's got all these titles 
um, you know, the soldier of the cross, uh, the messenger, the one who brings the good news, the minister to Paul, in other words, bringing encouragement. He's been longing to be with them all. And why? Because he fell ill at one time, apparently it says here, um, and he's been distressed. In other words, uh, Epaphroditus, uh, he wanted to make sure that they knew that he was okay. And Paul was saying that, yes, you've heard that he's ill, but he wanted to let you know that he was, even though near to death, God had mercy on him. And, and really, that's why I'm showing the picture. The picture is the fact that God has had mercy not only on him, Paul says, on me too. It's the greatest mercy of all, is that we all go back to, again, what the scripture saying. We started out our message today, our, 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 Bible les our Bible lesson, is that the reality is that we can't earn, we cannot buy, we cannot get salvation anyway. It is completely by Christ himself. In other words, he has shown mercy to us. You cannot earn it. You cannot buy it. That's why for us to be thinking that, oh gosh, it's all about our behavior for good enough. Oh no, <laughs> it doesn't work that way because there'd always be doubt. There's not a single person in this world that can be good enough, that can be nice enough, that can be kind enough, that can be helpful enough, that can be a servant enough. Notice strictly based upon the love that Jesus has for you and for me. And he's done all the work. He's done it all. That's why it's through grace, or by grace, through faith, we have been saved. That's what Paul is, again, echoing throughout the rest of Scripture, continually teaches that same exact message. And so, again, he says there at the end, he's eager to send him, that they may be rejoicing by being able to see him, and that Paul may be less anxious. Here he is to the great writer, Paul, right, that he's even, or will be, considered less ang anxious in this time. All right, so let's close it up then for today. So he tells them to receive him, verse 29, receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your services to me. So the picture I chose for the end here to close out for today, um, you know what? He, he's a missionary. He's a messenger. He's the one who brings the good news. And I, I see these hands, again, we're back to the hands of bringing the good news. Obviously, the Bible is there. And um, this letter of joy, he continually encourages people to have hope, to have really the idea that even though your surroundings aren't the best, receive him, receive people who are coming to bring you the good news. Uh, somebody on the screen this last week, by the way, um, after the storm had taken place um, with all the water in the basement, and again, just it was two rooms and, and some wet carpet and things like that, and the sump pumps also that, that made me nervous, but uh, Pastor Jerry came over and helped me at 1.30 in the morning uh, to be able to make sure that we weren't, wouldn't have more flooding. But uh, the reality was that, um, you know what, it's, it's a joyful time. It's, it's thankful that uh, it worked out for us. And, and even if it didn't work out, let's say that the whole basement would have been flooded. Would I have been sad? Well, of course. It would have um, been upsetting for my wife, uh, especially you know, with all of our stuff that we have, right? Storage for basement, um, the, the things that we have down there to enjoy. But the reality is, is that it's temporal. It's temporal. And, and somebody said, oh, well, you know, you have a great attitude about it. I'm like, but what else can you do? Um, am I excited about it that I had to stay up the whole night to watch to make sure everything worked out and I could get everything cleaned up? No. But the part of it that, that just says, you know what? Okay. Bummer that it happened. But let's move on. Let's keep going. And so that encouragement that, that Paul writes today, I think that that's something where if we put our focus on uh, what, what's happening here, um, you know, what are we risking actually? What are we risking in this life? Maybe that's a question that you want to answer now or as you go from this study today or even after we close our study. Think about what it is in your life that makes the difference. As you serve God, as you go forth in service, it's opportunity to be able to just share the love of Jesus 
and be a light in a darkened world. Um, I, I, by the way, I wore this t-shirt today. I think you can see that, right? That's the Concordia Seminary one. Uh, some of us are, are, are called to be professional light givers, right? I mean, I don't know if that's actually a term. I'm making things up. But uh, the reality is that some of us have been called into the ministry to go out and do these things. But the fact of the matter is, is that all of us have been called as believers in Jesus to share the love of Christ and to be lights in a darkened world. So whether you choose to be the candle or the star or the city on a hill, it doesn't matter. Let your light shine as you go forth this week, rejoicing that God has loved you so much. He's called you to be his own and that you have the Holy Spirit working in you to share the love of Jesus. You can make a difference as you go this week. Blessings as you go. Let's pray. Father God in heaven, we thank you for our time today. Short but sweet. And uh, Lord, we know that uh, you are a good and gracious God. Continue to bless us, Lord, that our lights may shine forth um, the good news of Jesus, that uh, all may know of your love that you have for your people. We ask and pray, Father, that you would uh, just continually be with us during this time, uh, especially, Lord, as it, it seems to be a time of uncertainty. And people are anxious and people are desperate and people are, again, wanting to uh, have answers. But Father, remind us that we do have the answer and it's in Jesus. Please help us to share that light and help us to, uh, again, to continually be joyful in all that you have done. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, God's blessings to you as you, uh, again, go forth this week. Continue to uh, share the love of God as you go. Blessings. Bye-bye.